1 Corinthians chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, we have a lot of them here. And so as I usually say, you, you want to have a copy of the Scriptures, so if you don't see one of the black Bibles in the chairs in front around you, uh, just look desperate or wave frantically or something, and somebody will get one for you. And uh, that's it. That's the way to go. Now. And it, then if they get you one, you get, or you're really fortunate, they may even open it up to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Or if you, if nobody helps you with that, you're sitting by somebody, just kind of look over on their Bible, kind of like, really wish I had your Bible. Maybe I didn't this. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 this evening. And I want to just read verse 1, we'll pray, and then we'll look at the material that's in its context. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Father, I pray that this evening that you would help us to look at men the accurate way, the way that you would have us to see them. God, I pray that you would help us to look at ourselves <coughs> in the same manner and that we would see ourselves as you see us and find our worth in what you've made us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to preach a message this evening, and it's it's on a topic. It's not topical in the sense that it's out of its context. It's actually what Paul is talking about when he's written this letter to the church at Corinth. Uh, Paul, that we know of, in, historically, Paul wrote about four letters to the church at Corinth, and two of them within the contents of those letters, it was indicated they were the Word of God. They were the Scripture. And the church always knew and recognized that. And so this would be uh, 1 Corinthians, a letter written to the church at Corinth. Corinth, if you study uh, the origin of the church, where the church at Corinth was founded, it's actually a really special place uh, for Paul. Paul had had it up to here with his kinsmen, with his brethren. And when he went to Corinth, that was, that was the way it was. In other words, every time Paul went anywhere, he was called, he was set apart, chosen. He indicates this several places, particularly in Romans, but in other epistles. He was set apart as an apostle to the Gentiles. So he was the one that God gifted to preach to the non-Jews, which is unique in the sense that before Paul was saved, Paul, of course, persecuted anything that wasn't a Pharisee. Anything that was not strictly along the lines of his Jewish education and background, Paul literally breathed out threatenings and slaughter against and was responsible for death to believers, to Christians. And so Paul was very, very Jewish, very protective of Jewish tradition uh, as he had grown up in it and known it. Not necessarily uh, the whole counsel of God is taught in the Scriptures, that God gave the Jews. But Paul was very defensive of Jewish tradition. And I find it rather ironic that when God saved Paul, as Jewish as he was, then he was called specifically and set apart by Jesus himself to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Now, you'd think, you'd think that Peter would have been the guy that they'd have made be an apostle to the Gentiles. He's the one that had the first vision, you remember, and uh, was responsible for seeing Gentiles get saved. But no, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. And so every time he and, and uh, the men who are always traveling with him on his journeys to preach the gospel, uh, a lot of times mostly Luke, but oftentimes Barnabas or Silas or Apollos, uh, occasionally John Mark and others, individuals, usually Paul would travel on a team of five to seven people. And when he would travel uh, from place to place, the first thing that they would do every time they went to a city was to go to the synagogue or to go down to the river. Because in a city where there was a synagogue, that's where you'd find the Jews. Paul was Jewish. The other apostles were Jewish and the men that traveled with them. And so the first thing they'd do would be to go to what then was a public forum. Now today the synagogue doesn't function exactly the way that it did in Paul's day. Today when you move to a community, then you have to pay a membership normally to a synagogue. And not just anybody in the community can walk into a synagogue and, uh, and talk there. But the word synagogue or synagogue simply means gathering place. And so the synagogue was actually an official gathering place for Jewish folks. And as Jews, uh, the Jewish believers, when they traveled, the first thing they do when they went to a city and they want to preach the gospel, they'd go to where the Jews were gathered. They'd go into the synagogue. 
If there was not a synagogue, maybe because the Jewish population was not large enough to merit a synagogue, or maybe because there was too much persecution of the Jews, which would have been very normal in Paul's day, then they would go down to the riverside. The Jews would always gather at the river. So uh, on the Sabbath, you could just go down to the river, and that's where you'd find the Jews. And that's what Paul always did. But Paul had had some experiences when he preached the gospel to his brethren. Normally, the way it would work out would be like this when you read the Acts of the Apostles. Normally, they'd go into the synagogue, and uh, folks, you know, they'd be introduced, and they would sometimes be asked to read, but they would present the gospel, and normally, when they would present that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, that He was Emmanuel, God with us, that He was the King of the Jews, normally they had a pretty good reception in the sense that usually people ask a lot of questions. Well, that's what you want when you're sharing the gospel, actually. You want people to ask questions because the Word of God has answers to the questions, and that's what they do. They'd answer the questions, and all of a sudden, a lot of people would start saying, wow, this Jesus is the Christ. And so people would get saved, and then the Jewish leadership would hear about it. They'd come in, and then they would begin to strongly persecute them, usually try to falsely accuse them to the local authorities and say that they're causing sedition or different things, and do every nasty thing that they could to drive them out of town. And that happened to Paul literally every place he went. If you read the things that happened to Paul where he went, and usually, I mean, the, Jew, the Jews, they were literally like, uh, what do they call them? They suborned, what kind of men was it that they would get? Uh, how does how the scripture say? Basically like mobsters. They were a bunch of mobsters. And they'd come to town and they would threaten them with their lives, try to kill them. Certain and every time, what were they called? Certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. Certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. Yes, I love that description of the guys. They, they get these guys and basically pay and raise up a bunch of thugs uh, sort of a George Soros kind of a thing, if you know what I'm talking about, to go and literally cause so much trouble that the apostles would have to leave town. And Paul got to a point in his ministry where he shook the dust off his feet and he said, from henceforth, he said, you know, your blood be on your hands. From henceforth, I'm going to the Gentiles. I'm not preaching the gospel to you Jews anymore. I'm done with you. He's a Jew. I'm done with you. I'm not preaching the gospel to you guys ever again. And he went and joined himself to a house, and the house had a synagogue attached to it, and the leader of the synagogue's name was Crispus. And that guy, Crispus, Paul came into contact with him, and he believed the gospel with all his heart in his house. And, this, and God's Spirit came to Paul and said, you know, don't be alarmed, be calm, basically. You're going to have a period of ministry where you're not going to be persecuted for a while. And literally in Corinth, this is where this happened at, in Corinth, Paul had Jews be open and receptive to the gospel, his kinsmen. And Gentiles were open and receptive to the gospel. And he got to stay, if you look at the Acts, he got to stay in Corinth for more than a year's time, which he never lasted more than like a week or two. I mean, he'd start preaching the gospel, things are going great, that somebody try to kill him and he'd have to leave. And Paul got to stay there in Corinth for Paul. If you can imagine, if you're, if you're kind of a pastoral father figure, he was an apostle, if you can imagine the place in your heart, a place like Corinth would have for you, literally for Paul, is sort of a, a haven, if you will. It was that place where God restored his confidence in his brethren or his love for his brethren, and God showed him, hey, listen, it's individuals that receive Jesus as their Savior. It isn't Jews and Gentiles, and it isn't these people are no good, these people are are good. If you're going to be an apostle to the Gentiles, you have to understand who their Savior is. And you have to understand what happens to the Gentiles. And literally, they become part of the tribe of Judah grafted in through Jesus Christ. And so you can't be anti-Semitic and be a Jewish apostle. And God just fixed everything in Paul's heart at Corinth. Really a special place. You know, some of us have had circumstances like that, haven't we? Places of mending or healing where, you know, even if we've responded or reacted wrong, God in His great mercy just very, very patiently, sort of like Elijah when he was in the cave, and God had a raven coming to bring him some meat, and, bring him, and he has had a brook to drink at, and God just restored him so that he got back. And, that, and Corinth was that place for Paul, was that place of restoration. And so when you study and you read the letters to the Corinthians, and you see uh, the brusqueness, if you will, or the abruptness of the Apostle Paul, remember who these people are to him as he's writing the letters. that help a little bit? Now, I'm not going to be preaching through Corinthians, but it introduces our context this evening. Paul began in, Corinth, in the first chapter of this letter to the church at Corinth by really 
right away after he introduced, uh, he'd, he'd gone through the introduction phase of his letter by right away pointing out that that church had some major problems with a lack of unity. And some major problems with a lack of unity. And the first problem that Paul pointed out was that the people in the church were saying things like, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Now, all of those things are noble in and of themselves. In other words, if a guy said, you know, Paul is an apostle, led me to the Lord. And I'm, a, I'm a follower of Apostle Paul. Or somebody else would say, you know, Apollos, you know, he is so eloquent in explaining the Scripture. You know, I'm kind of a disciple of Apollos. Or if somebody said, you know, Peter, man, there's just nothing like the simplicity, the way that Peter lays out the gospel and preaches it. I'm a disciple of Peter. You know, I'm following Peter. And other ones would say, well, you know what? I met the Lord Jesus myself, and, and uh, he's, he's God. I, I saw the things that he did that testify that he's God, and I'm a believer in Jesus. You know, uh, every one of those, I used to think when I would read that statement, well, if it's me, I'm not going to follow Paul and Apollos and, and uh, Cephas. I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, right? But literally, when the believers at Corinth would say, I'm of the Paul faction, or I'm of the Apollos, or I'm of the Cephas, or I'm the Christ faction, literally, it was against the other guys. So Paul writes a letter to the church at Corinth, and they say, who's Paul? <laughs> I think it's Paul didn't leave me the Lord. I, I don't care what Paul said. Well, who was Paul? Well, he explains that this evening in our text. They say, who's Cephas? <laughs> you know, Paul led, Paul's the first guy here who prays the gospel. I don't care about that. I mean, who's Peter think he is coming to town, you know, with his, his, uh, you know, his wild fisherman accent, thinks he can come here and own the place. You know, uh, who's who's Cephas? Who's you know who's Apollos? Man, that guy's just too polished for me. I don't, I just don't dig that myself personally. I like guys that are down here. Other ones are like, you know, I don't like any of them guys. You know, I don't need anything but Jesus. Just me and Jesus. And I used to wonder, you know, what's wrong with saying I'm of Christ? But what they were actually saying was that they rejected the men that God had called to be apostles to them when they said I'm following Jesus. By saying that they were followers of Jesus, they were saying I reject the people that God sent as God's authority. And so in saying, I'm only following Jesus, they were actually rejecting Jesus. Because who gave the apostles as foundational members of the church? Jesus. Who called Paul? Who called Apollos? Who called Cephas? Yeah, Jesus did. So when you rejected those men, you were rejecting Jesus. And so the words didn't quite have the meaning, this, the quote, spirituality that they had the intent of, right? I mean, you could make a pretty good argument with it, right? you were to say it the right way, but actually the motive behind it was uh, that they were rejecting God's authority. Who did the church at Corinth need to minister to them? Well, they needed Paul and Apollos and Cephas and, and Jesus. They needed all those men. That's who God gave them, all those people. And Christian, you and I, well, we're all prideful, aren't we? Except for a couple of us. We're, we're all prideful, aren't we? Uh, you ever tell somebody something you know they didn't know and they tell you they already knew it just because they don't want you to know that they learned something from you? And you, very, you know, some people are like, oh, I didn't know that. But some people are like, yeah, I know, I know. You ever meet the I know person? I mean, you can tell them anything they didn't know. I know, I know, I know. You don't have to tell me, I know. Yeah, you meet that kind of person. We're, we all have a little bit of that in us. See, it, it's in us a little bit. Uh, not, not many of us wants to confess that Somebody may have studied something we haven't studied or thought something we haven't thought or learned something we haven't learned. And it's just in us. We're prideful. We're very, very prideful that way. Especially when it comes to authority. When it comes to the authority to tell a person, you know what? God says this ought to be in your life. And we don't, we don't any of us naturally like authority. It's just not natural for us. Some of us do better with it than others. We've got a better spirit about us, perhaps, than others. We don't naturally like authority. We're prideful. And so Paul has gone through the reasons in chapters 2 and 3 of Corinthians that explain why it is that the people are divided over leadership in the church. He's concluded that the reason you're divided over leadership is actually because you're carnal and not spiritual. You know, carnal people are prideful people, aren't they? Spiritual people actually aren't very prideful. 
Can we say spiritual people aren't prideful? You know, it doesn't harm a spiritual person to listen to something and to hear something or ask, could this be so? Does it? And so Paul's diagnosis was that you're, you're carnal, you're not spiritual. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness on him, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. So you have problems with all the things, all this issue, and really the issue is leadership and following the people that God's given you. And the reason you've got a problem with it is it's a spiritual problem. And then in chapter 3 and verse um, 21, Paul concludes by saying, Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life, or death, or things present, or things to come. All are yours, and ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. Also, all of these things, not Paul's things, or Cephas's things, or these truths, or that truth, it's the whole thing. These are all for you, and you are all for Jesus, and Christ is all for God. So Paul is saying, hey, listen, it's all for the same cause, all for the same purpose. And Paul is not preaching an ecumenical unity speech here, understand. Paul's the same guy that writes letters saying, mark them which cause divisions among you and avoid them, those sort of things. So he's not saying, well, listen, you know, let's just all agree to disagree and all get along. No, what he's saying is you can't compartmentalize biblical spiritual truth. Some Christians do it this way. I've seen it. I've met Christians that won't read the New Testament of the Scripture. I know Christians that are just like, well, you know, uh, I just I like the deeper things of the Old Testament or the more mysterious things of the Old Testament. I know, I, I know men that if you ask them to teach Sunday school, they'll never teach out the New Testament. They're going to allegorize some Old Testament story, but they won't teach the New Testament. I know Christians that won't teach the Old Testament or won't read the Old Testament of the Scripture. They'll say, hey, we live in the... You know, we live in the church age, the age of grace, and we don't need to read the Old Testament of the Scripture. It's all God's Word. It's all about Jesus. It's all valid for us. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So God has it all for us. But I know people that do that. What's the source of that? Carnality and pride. And so that's Paul's conclusion here. And now Paul says this is how to treat people. And Christian, if I could title the message this evening, it would be how to treat spiritual leaders or how to treat Christian leadership. It's a pretty simple message. And you say, well, I don't know when I'll get the chance to practice it. I don't know either, but you will. We need to know how to preach, how to treat people that God gives us, men of God, if you will, or leadership, people that God has placed in our life. Do you believe that there's still spiritual authority today? We don't have apostles today, do we? But we do have pastors. We do have people that God set in the church as elders that are an authority in the church. We have preachers. And the danger each of us runs into is either giving too much to a person or too little to a person with regard to veneration or respect. There's not a lot of balance in it. I see, I see oftentimes disrespect to God's authority and I see reverence to God's authority, and neither of those are actually appropriate. And so look what Paul said in chapter uh, 4 and verse 1. He said, Let a man so account of us as of ministers of Christ and as stewards of the mysteries of God. So account. Account means this is, this is what we are. This is what you reckon us to be. He said we are ministers. Now the word minister in today's culture is a title, but actually minister in that culture simply meant slave or servant or a person who serves out or dispenses out. So the word minister, you know, it always cracks me up when people use the title, the minister, as though it's some title. Well, Paul said, let us account, or let people think of us as ministers or slaves. And then he said stewards. Now a steward, is another word for steward that maybe could help you, yeah, there's more to it than this, but a steward really would be a manager. One who manages something. In other words, the things that he has, the most important concept of stewardship is that the things that he manages aren't his things. In other words, he is managing something, trying to increase something, trying to take care of a thing, but he's doing it for someone else. And so a manager is 
you know, manager's a great position, actually, isn't it? Depending on what you get to manage. You know, I don't want to be necessarily like a manager of a, stu of a, uh, uh, a sewer plant, you know. But I wouldn't mind being a manager of, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe Fort Knox or something. You know, it depends on what you're managing, right? We're talking about the mysteries of God. The apostles were responsible. We didn't have the New Testament in the Scripture. So they were literally foundational gifts to the church. They were responsible of dispensing out, managing, stewarding out the mysteries or the truths about God. Now, if you were to accept the Apostle Paul and the things that he was teaching from God and about God, that'd be good. But what if you rejected Cephas? Well, you kind of have a one-dimensional reception, wouldn't you? you wouldn't, you'd only get something from one person. And so Paul said, I want you to account of us, or here's how to think of us. That we are managers, we're, we're, we are first servants or slaves. And we are dispensers, people who give out the mysteries of God. Now, when it comes to giving out the mysteries of God, is there a level of importance or is it all just, it's from God? It's all important. See, Paul said, it's not us that's important. What's important about us, us, is what we're teaching you. It's the truth that we're teaching. The speaker or the teacher is never so impressive as the book which is taught. And the teacher who does not teach the book is not impressive at all. It's not helpful at all. Isn't any good at all? God give us Christians that say, "Well, if they're not going to preach the Bible, I don't really care what they have to say." Not in a disrespectful, unkind way, but I don't have time for that because this is what is supposed to be ministered or taught. Man, we need churches that the Scripture and the teaching of Scripture is heavy. It's just you know, if you're going to disagree with what's preached or taught, you're going to have to just get over so much Scripture to come to a different conclusion because it's the Scripture that's taught, not the opinion or not the uh, personality of the speaker. Now, every speaker has a personality. Paul had a personality. They said that uh, his letters are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence was weak and his speech was contemptible. <laughs> so he's a terrible speaker, and he was probably not uh, too impressive to look at. Very unlike your speaker this evening. So... I had to get a joke in there. We're getting too serious. <laughs> um, and so here he said, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Now, who are the stewards? Who are the stewards? Ministers. Yeah, the ministers. Paul, the apostles. Now, how many of us have learned verse 2 of chapter 4 by itself? I'm not saying that's a problem, but most of us have, right? You know, we've got to be faithful to God. Well, actually, we're, I'm not saying that that's, that's, that's okay to, to, to take the Scripture and to divorce it from its context to some degree and use it in a way that's accurate. But the fact of the matter is it's in the context of how we're supposed to look at God's authority or God's messenger. We're supposed to look at them as stewards, and we are supposed to require of them that they be faithful stewards. It's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And that's the actual context. That's what the Scripture is actually teaching here. So it's great, you know, when you're teaching a second grader and saying you need to be faithful. Uh, you know, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. It's fine to take that verse out of its context. Put it with this verse in its context. But actually what this verse is saying in verse 2, if you'll see it this evening, is that we need to require those individuals that preach the Word of God to be faithful. That's, what we need to, that's how we need to look at leadership. In other words, we look at leadership as individuals who dispense, who serve us, and who dispense the mysteries of God. Now, let me ask you a question. If someone served you for God, on God's behalf, and someone dispensed biblical spiritual truth with God's authority on your behalf, how would you view them? Let's start with like or dislike. 
like, right? Okay, so we like them. How many of them? Well, anybody that's going to serve God on my behalf, I like. Any of them. All of them. Right? Okay. Um, reverence. Respect. Gratitude. Gratitude. Yeah, gratitude. Okay. Now, <laughs> am I proud if somebody who I'm grateful for condescends to speak to me? I've met, I've met Christians who are like Christian celebrity name droppers. <laughs> I'm being a little bit silly about it, but I'm serious. Yeah, hey brother, you know, just like yesterday I was talking to, and they'll drop a Christian celebrity name. You know, but you know, we were chatting. In other words, I talk to a well-known Christian preacher or something. Uh, there isn't any of that there, is there? Honestly. I understand having a full schedule and being busy. There is a such thing as being too busy. I, I understand that as well. Uh, there's nothing special about somebody who is a servant having time to talk to you. There's something wrong with somebody who is a servant and a steward not having time to talk to you. Get it? So, uh, appreciation, respect, but um, being impressed by the person's person is the truth that they dispense. And Paul said, this is how you count of us. We're slaves for Jesus. People aren't really like bragging about being friends of slaves. Stewards of the mysteries of the gospel of Christ. We need that, don't we? So we're grateful for it. Verse 3. But with me it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I, I judge not my own self, for I know nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Now this is not Paul's version of the you don't know me, you can't judge me line. This is Paul simply, and he's not saying I don't care what you all think, only God can judge me. But what he's simply saying is it's, it's not a big deal to me if you don't like me. It's not a problem. It's not something I need to be personally vindicated for. Now, in other places in the Scripture, we see Paul rigorously defend his apostleship. Don't we? You see Paul defending his apostleship very rigorously when people say, well, you know what? He wasn't one of the original twelve apostles and he's, he used to persecute Christians and I don't see how he could be an apostle. And Paul would rigorously defend his qualifications and his call to be an apostle. Every letter Paul wrote, Paul, an apostle. He used the title. He was an apostle. But here Paul is saying, your esteem of me has really nothing to do with anything that I actually am or with my well-being. I need you to approve of me. Now why would Paul defend his apostleship on the one hand and on the other hand say, I don't really care what you think about me? There's a reason for it. There's a contrast here. Why, why would he do that? Why would he on the one hand say, it's a small thing for me to be judged of you? And on the other hand, say, you know, this, these are the reasons that I am qualified to be an apostle. Why would he defend his apostleship and then not have a problem? Is there a difference? Is he, is he speaking out of two sides of his mouth? It's a difference. Okay, well that could be that could be true, but it's not exactly the answer I'm looking for. Because the importance of being an apostle. In other words, if you question Paul's apostleship, then the, the, the scripture that the Holy Spirit gave him to pen had no authority. So if you question his apostleship, you're questioning God's call, God's authority. You're not questioning him, you're questioning God. Paul says, you question me personally. <laughs> me too. <laughs> uh, I, I
this story quite a few times probably, but uh, there was a guy, he's, he's long been with the Lord, but Tom Malone, uh, pastor in Michigan, wrote in his biography or something, he wrote about um, this uh, preacher friend that he had, who was, I think the guy was American Baptist or Southern Baptist, but Tom Malone at the time was a Methodist. And, uh, but he'd become a Baptist through the acquaintance of this guy, but this guy was came to his church, I think it was Reverend Black, or Pastor Black, I think was his name, I'm not even sure about that, but it was somewhere in Michigan. And one time, he was just talking about the friendship with this guy, and this is one of the anecdotes that he shared in order to give you a little bit of idea of the kind of a man that this pastor was. He said one time, the church brought like a list of issues that they had with the pastor, or things, accusations they had against the pastor, and he got a hold of the list. And so, before service, I think it was on a Sunday night, he got up and he read the list from the pulpit. And then he said, I plead guilty to all of them. I'm guilty of all of them. And then he preached his message. In other words, you know, his attitude was, yeah, I'm a sinner. I'm nobody. I'm nothing. But that had nothing to do in his mind with his call to be the pastor of that church or his qualification to be God's servant because all he has to do is confess. I'm not saying make light of the, of the sin or make light of whatever. But friend, if you want, to, you want to put your finger on things, you can find things. People can find things in your life too. And Paul understood, I wasn't called to be an apostle because of my greatness. I was called to be an apostle because of the grace of God. Do you see the contrast there? As Paul says, you can say anything you want to about me. It's, you know, I'm worse than that, actually. He called himself the chiefest of sinners, and he was, not, he was not using that as an expression. He literally was responsible for murdering Christians. You read, look at Paul before he was born again. That is an evil man. So Paul's not being pretentious or pretending to be humility or to be humble here. He just says, you know what, you can say what you want to about me, and that's just me. But now when it comes to God's call, that's a different matter altogether, isn't it? You see the distinction there? And so the, the important thing is not me. The important thing is that we're stewards of the mysteries of the gospel of God. And then verse 5, Paul said, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. And that's a positive way of putting it, isn't it? Because I think some of us will perhaps have less praise of God than we like to think. Paul said, let's just wait until we stand before God and we'll see what God says. It will help you in your life if you stop trying to find out what's wrong with people. Now, I'm not talking about somebody comes and they need help and you, you ask important questions to see what the root is. I'm just talking about, I know, <laughs> I know that, I know he's, he looks good, but I know he's not. I'm talking about, and Paul said, God's going to reveal the secret things, the hidden things. Let's wait until God reveals them. You know, it's a very, very comfortable thing for me not to have to wonder what you might be up to. If God wants me to know, He'll definitely show me. And God does show me things a lot. <laughs> my wife can tell you. I can't. I have good enough memory to remember. But my wife can tell you of just tons of things where people do things secretly, and God shows me. I mean, it's just unbelievable how God just tells somebody, mention this to pastor, and I find out about something. Whatever. I mean, it just God shows me stuff all the time. I, um, <laughs> I don't want to say this the wrong way, but I know some things about some of you that you don't think I know. Because God showed me. And I'm not talking about I, I'm guessing at it. I know about it. I know. And uh, God God will deal with it. God will work, work on it. And that sort of thing. So this is Paul saying, let's like God. Let's like God deal with things. You think you have secrets. You think people don't know. Uh, but you'd be surprised what God knows. And sometimes what God shows people if He wants them to know. Verse 6. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Well, so the point of all this is that He said, this is the way I act, this is the way Apollos acts, and this is the way I want you to act. Because we don't need to be puffed up. We don't need big shots when we have a big Jesus. We don't need big people when we have a big God. 
Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. And then verse 7, he points out the last thing. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Okay, let's answer those questions one at a time. We'll be finished. Who maketh thee to differ from another? God. What hast thou that thou didst not receive? Say it loudly because people are getting wrong. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Uh, now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? And this last question is one of those questions that you can't answer if you've done the wrong thing. This is like when your parents say, tell me why you did that. You know, give me one good reason why you did that. Tell me. Tell me why you did that. And you're thinking it was a stupid thing to do. And if you want a reason for it, there's no way in the world I can give you one. I'm just dumb. I don't know. <laughs> you know? Right. And I'm just dumb is not an acceptable answer for them. They don't want to know that they are a dumb child. So it's like there's no good answer. Well, this is one of those things where you just can't. There's no way you can answer it right. Uh, if God gave it to you, why are you bragging about it? God gave it to you, why are you bragging about it? It was given to you. You don't have any credit for having it. You just get to rejoice in that God's given it to you. And guys, I don't know when this will be used, when God will practically use it for you, but I have found that the Lord has used this passage of Scripture in my life to help me to discern the kind of spiritual leaders to put myself under and to discern uh, the attitudes to look for that belie what we are actually in Jesus. If you have a leader, you have a person who is very, very about being recognized or being reverenced or respected or having their title, it bothers them. Some folks can't, I mean, they can't be made light of or they can't have somebody say something about them and not take it the wrong way. If you have a leader that's that way, my friend, be real careful about that because that person does not account himself as a steward of the mystery of God. He counts himself as somebody. And if anybody's anybody, it's because of Jesus, isn't it so? In other words, if we as believers learn to find our worth in Jesus Christ, we'll find that we're very worthy. Did you hear me? We're very worthy. I don't have to bow my head low and walk by other people as though they're better than me when I'm a child of the King. Do I? There's nobody in the world that's better than me. And it's not because I'm as good as anybody. No, I'm just saying, Jesus Christ shed His blood for me. I'm God's child. I'm God's king. I, I, I'm, God's, I'm a child of the king. I'm God's, the, the blood of God's Son has covered me. So I'm worthy. I'm worthy to go into the presence of God. Who are you? It's not with an attitude, but that's literally how it is. I'm worthy to go in the presence of God. Who are you? And that's the way every one of us as believers ought to be. If you find your worth in Jesus, my friend, it won't bother you if people don't give you the respect you deserve. They ought to know who I am. Well, who are you that God didn't make you? So if somebody disrespects God's servant, whom are they disrespecting? God, are you concerned if you're that servant that God can't handle it? I'm not. But let's be right in how we treat one another and how we treat God's servants. I hope that's a help to you. Father, thank you for the truth we see in the Scripture tonight. We ask that you would increase it in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.